Hello everyone! Welcome to Getting Better Health and Medicine in History, a virtual family event with the Tenement Museum. My name is Rose. I'm a lead educator at the Tenement Museum. Today we're going to be talking about health. I imagine in the last few months you've been talking with a lot of people about health. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed daily life for basically everyone in big ways and in small. Here at the Tenement Museum, we've been thinking a lot about what history has to tell us about how to live our lives right now. We are going to look at what people in the past did to care for their health. First, I'm going to introduce you to the Tenement Museum. The Tenement Museum is a history museum located in the Lower East Side of New York City. This red brick building on the left is 97 Orchard Street. 97 Orchard Street is a tenement, which is an old-fashioned word for an apartment building. At the Tenement Museum, we tell the stories of the real families who once lived in this building and others like it in the neighborhood. Nobody lives in the apartments at 97 Orchard Street today, but about 100 years ago, many people did, sometimes as many as 100 people living in the building at one time. Many of those people were immigrants, people who moved to the United States from a different country, or they were the children of immigrants. Let's take a look at what some of those residents did to care for their health. This is a photo of the Confino family. They lived at 97 Orchard Street in the 1910s. In this picture, you can see Rachel and Avram, the mother and father, and four of their children, Victoria, David, Saul, and Jacob. This is a photo of their apartment in New York at 97 Orchard Street, as we've recreated it at the Tenement Museum. This is the family's living room, the biggest room in the apartment. Ten family members shared the apartment in total, so the living room was also used as a shared bedroom. Before the Confino family moved to New York, they lived in what would today be known as Greece, in a town called Castoria. This is a postcard of Castoria. You can see many homes with red roofs up and down the side of some hills, and a wide blue lake with another green mountain behind it. When the Confinos lived in Castoria, if one of them was feeling achy or sick, they would sometimes use something called ventosas to help them feel better. These are ventosas. They look like very small, round water glasses. Ventosas are used with heat to make little suction cups on a person's skin, usually on their back or their chest. The suction temporarily pulls the skin away from the body, which is supposed to relieve tension and improve blood flow. When the cups are removed, it sometimes leaves behind a small round bruise or mark. The Confinos continued using Ventosas after they left Castoria and moved to New York. Perhaps Rochelle even packed her set of Ventosas in her suitcase for the journey. Immigrating to the United States was a huge change for the Confino family. They had to get used to a bustling city, a smaller home, new languages, new work, new schooling. The point of using ventosas is to help your body feel better. But I imagine for the Confinos, using ventosas when they felt sick in New York might also have been a comfort for their minds. It can be scary to feel ill in an unfamiliar place. Having a familiar remedy from their old country and a familiar person, Rochelle, taking care of them might have helped New York feel more like home. When Victoria grew up, she passed this healing tradition on to her children, and she's not alone. The use of ventosas is sometimes called cupping. Cupping therapy has a long history in several cultures, dating back to ancient Egypt, China, and the Middle East. And many people use cupping today. In modern day New York, you can even get cupping done just a few blocks away from where Victoria and her family lived 100 years ago on the Lower East Side, in Manhattan's Chinatown. The Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps has been known to use cupping sometimes too. This is a photograph of Phelps in the pool. If you look closely, you can see the red or purple colored circles on the tops of his shoulders. Athletes like Phelps use cupping therapy to reduce soreness after training really hard. Even though the Confinos brought healing traditions with them from their old home in Castoria, they might also have combined those remedies with remedies that were popular in their new home here in the United States. That might include using a steam inhaler like this one. Have you ever found that standing in a hot shower helps when you have a stuffy nose? This inhaler uses the same idea, steam from hot air, to help open your airways. This inhaler has two parts, a cup with handles on the bottom and a funnel on the top. To use the inhaler, you'd fill the bowl with hot water, place the funnel on top, and then put your face in the opening of the funnel to inhale the warm, steamy air. Maybe if Victoria Confino had a cold, her family might have had her try both ventosas and an inhaler. Neither one would cure her cold, but they might help her symptoms and generally help her feel better. Colds and sickness are a part of everyday life, both now and in the past. But what if it's not just one or two people getting sick? Let's take a look at how tenement residents handled major outbreaks like the one that we're seeing today. 
This is Celia and Boris, nicknamed Bernie Bernescu. Bernie and Celia are brother and sister. In the year 1918, Celia and Bernie lived at 97 Orchard Street with their brothers, sisters, and parents. Celia and Bernie were born in New York, but their parents were immigrants from the Russian Empire. This is a photograph of an apartment at 97 Orchard Street, similar to what the Bernescu home might have looked like. Just like the Confinos, the Bernescus had to be creative with space, so their kitchen might have had a space for sleeping in it, as well as a stove, table, pots, and pans. Celia and Bernie were living at 97 Orchard Street the same year the world experienced a pandemic, the flu pandemic of 1918. Some people call this pandemic the Spanish flu, but it really had very little to do with Spain. The flu still exists today. Maybe you've even had the flu. But the flu virus of 1918 was different. Many more people got sick, and many more of the people who got sick got dangerously sick. Eventually, the flu of 1918 became a pandemic, which means that many people got sick across multiple countries. During the 1918 flu pandemic in New York City, the government put up posters throughout the city with information on the outbreak and advice about what to do to avoid spreading the flu. These signs told people to wash their hands and cover coughs and sneezes. They advised people to stop going to parties or other big gatherings. There were other changes too. Lots of restaurants, saloons, lodges, skating rinks, dance halls, churches, and temples closed. Kids under the age of 12 were banned from going to movie theaters. Anyone who got sick had to quarantine, either stay in their home or stay in a hospital. Celia and Bernie probably started wearing face masks made of gauze or handkerchiefs when they went outside in hopes of preventing the spread of the virus. In some places, it was actually required to wear a mask outside. They probably saw a lot of their neighborhood locals wearing them too, from sanitation workers to their mail carrier. Sounds familiar, huh? This is all stuff that we're dealing with today. You probably know better than anybody how Celia and Bernie felt. It was scary. They worried about family and friends who got sick. They worried that other people that they knew would get sick. It was sad. They missed loved ones who were quarantining. They were disappointed when fun things that they had been looking forward to were canceled, like trips to the movies, birthday parties, plays, dances. But there were also things about life during the 1918 pandemic that were really different from living through the pandemic today in 2020. For one thing, communicating information was really different back then. There was no internet, no Zoom, no texting, and far fewer telephones. To check in on their friends during the pandemic, Celia and Bernie would have had to visit them in person, which they knew risked spreading the flu, or send a letter and wait for the other person to send a letter back, which took a long time. Today, we have the option to hold school online. We can get news and even watch movies safely at home. In 1918, not so much. The New York City government actually decided to keep school and movie theaters open, even at the height of the pandemic. Government officials knew that people gathering together in big groups inside made the risk of spreading the flu higher. But they argued that if they couldn't show newsreels about the pandemic at the movies, and if they couldn't teach kids about the flu in classrooms, then there would be no way to get people up-to-date information about how to stay healthy. So, as weird as it is to switch to school online or celebrate a birthday on FaceTime, those are options that we have to stay healthy and stay connected that Bernie and Celia just didn't have. And medicine was also really different in 1918. At that time, scientists understood that germs existed, but some people still thought that disease was spread through bad air. Some of the remedies that doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers used to treat people who were sick in 1918 are similar to treatments we use today, like rest, drinking fluids, and steam inhalers. But some didn't work as well. For example, in 1918, the health commissioner of New York City recommended that people infected with the flu should soak their feet in a bath of warm water with mustard in it. Some people wore smelly bags of a waxy substance called camphor around their necks to prevent the flu. Now, those particular remedies wouldn't have hurt anybody, but it probably wouldn't have cured them either. And some other treatments that doctors recommended in 1918 to treat the flu, like mercury compounds or super, super high doses of aspirin, were actually dangerous. In 1918, scientists were still learning what to do to treat the flu, and there was a lot that we hadn't discovered yet. Nevertheless, the flu pandemic of 1918 ended. It took a long time. Things didn't get better all at once. The first reported case in the United States happened in March of 1918, and some historians say that the outbreak didn't end until summer of 1919. But it did end. 
eventually more and more places started reporting fewer and fewer new cases of the flu. And slowly, people started going back to safely doing the things that they had done before, like eating in restaurants and going to birthday parties. Celia and Bernie Bernescu both survived. These are pictures of them in 1925 as young adults. As the flu pandemic began to go away, some lessons emerged. Places where governments and individuals took steps to limit their physical contact with people, it helped. Fewer people got sick and the outbreak went away faster. These days, a little over 100 years later, scientists have developed much more effective treatments for the flu, both to help people feel better when they are sick and to keep people from getting sick in the first place. Most importantly, today we have the yearly flu vaccine. The flu shot keeps millions of people from getting the flu each year. Hopefully someday, when the COVID-19 pandemic is in the past, we'll be able to look back and say, back then, we didn't know as much about how to treat coronaviruses as we do now. Or hopefully, and now we have the coronavirus vaccine. But that doesn't change the fact that living through a pandemic today can be scary, sad, and just weird. So let's take a look at what people are doing today to find comfort during the pandemic. Here at the Tenement Museum, we have an initiative called Your Story, Our Story. It's a website where anyone can submit an object that represents their history or their experience of migration or cultural identity. Since the pandemic started, we've created a collection of stories from that project that we're calling Objects of Comfort, where we're gathering stories from people today about what they're using to find comfort during this stressful time. This is Meng Shu's story. Hello everyone, my name is Meng Shu. I'm a senior studying history at Bremerton University. Four years ago, I came to U.S. to start my undergrad study here. For Your Story, Our Story project, I wrote about a necklace that was given to me from my mother. When I was young, I often got sick, and Chinese people believe that a necklace with a good meaning can protect young children. And that's why my mother gave this necklace to me. During this uncertain and difficult time, I think the necklace gives me peace and comfort and makes me appreciate my health and my family. Meng Shu's story reminds me a little of the Confino family, who we talked about earlier. I think about how a healing tradition sometimes brings peace and comfort, not just through the practice itself, but also through the relationships and memories it brings to mind. In Meng Shu's case, the care and protection of her mother. Caitlin also wrote about family, and how the memory of her grandmother is helping her find comfort right now. Hi, my name is Caitlin Liu. I am a junior in Lisa Young's community engagement class, and recently I wrote for Your Story, Our Story about my grandma who immigrated from Taiwan. I wrote about these two folding fans in her apartment that remind me of the gift of words which I think she gave to me whenever she used to visit when I was a kid and we would spend our summer days reading. So, at a time when schooling is online and I'm an English major, I'm really comforted every time I pick up a book and I can think of my grandma. Folding fans and books might not have anything to do with medicine or health, but it seems like they help Caitlin remember who she is and what's important to her, things that don't change even during a pandemic. Meng Shu and Caitlin's objects and memories are a part of their lives now, but they're also a part of history too. Remember, a lot of what we've learned about the health practices and virus outbreaks of the past, we know from the words, pictures, and memories of the people who experienced them. That means people like you you will one day be experts in what it was like to live through the COVID-19 pandemic. What do you want people to know in the future? Maybe you want people to know about the creative ways that you helped your loved ones get through quarantine. Maybe you want people to know about what changed for you or your family or your community. Maybe you want people to know about what stayed important to you even during the pandemic. Before we go, I want to wish you health, comfort, courage, and whatever else you may be needing right now. These are not easy times, but if our work at the Tenement Museum tells us anything, it's that even this pandemic will one day be part of the story of the past. It can happen soon enough, but it will happen. Until then, you're a part of history, and we're rooting for you. Take care.